So it's hard to follow such an illustrious uh, lineup of speakers, so uh, I'm, if I disappoint, I'll apologize up front, but I'll still try. So I'm going to try to talk to you about this idea of performing an informatics consult. And before I dive into that, I want to walk you through sort of you know, one slide worth of mindset. So we talk a lot about precision health on this campus. And there's precision in the science of medicine, where we talk about measuring millions of things on one person, genome, microbiome, met, gut, you know, metabolome, whatever. There's precision in the practice of medicine, where the idea is to learn from some information gathered on millions of people to make a better decision for the next person that walks in the door. And then finally, less often talked about, is the precision in meeting the patient's goals of care. And it's one of the few campuses, uh, uh, Stanford is one of the few campuses where all of these three initiatives happen, and it, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be working in this area. So I work mostly in the precision and the practice of medicine field, and my lab does work on three buckets of projects. Clinical studies, you know, patient with metastatic prostate cancer now has androgen deprivation treatment, what's the risk of Alzheimer's? The classic clinical study leads to a PDF, and as one of the speakers said, you know, gets buried. Then there is learning new things from the data. The idea to ask questions that a doctor doesn't ask. And the third is building predictive models. And again, predictive models, the problem with doing them with the HR data uh, is that it's like a flight data recorder that records after the flight has crashed. Because you don't have all of those intermediate measurements. We need them from the patients. So all of those caveats aside, if I believe for a minute that what all the previous speakers laid out is going to happen, as in health systems will start sharing data, patients will contribute and fill in the blanks, there will be software that's able to query across all of them, then what do we do? So a couple of years ago, we started working on a problem that is that assuming all of these prior problems are solved and are a given, what is it that we can do? So uh, with Chris Longhurst and Bob Harrington, we wrote up this idea of a green button. And it's my only paper with absolutely no data in it. Uh, it, it is in a journal uh, where a lot of people uh, got together talking about the role of big data in healthcare. We got this in as a perspective piece. And the idea is that when a patient walks in the door for which you do not have RCT-based evidence, which happens about 95% of the time, what is it that you would do? And our idea is that you would be able to describe your patient, and in this case, a 55-year-old Vietnamese woman uh, with asthma and now has hypertension. You don't need a computer to tell you what the outcome should be. You don't need a computer to help you diagnose the problem. But what is the intervention that will work? What is the antihypertensive we're going to use? Not a single clinical trial for this. If all of the data that we're talking about existed, what could we do? So that's the idea of an informatics consult. And I'll walk you through two examples. So scenario one, which second line drug to use for treating diabetics of high A1C uh, two months after first line treatment? There is no RCT-based guidance on this. So I was fortunate to be able to collaborate with a large group of uh, 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 collaborators uh, called the Observational Health Data Science and Informatics Group based out of Columbia University. And as a first start, we asked the question, how is diabetes currently treated? So what we're looking at here, the innermost circle is the first line drug that is given to people who have diabetes. The second circle is the second line, third line, fourth line goes all the way to 20. And the color tells you which drug it is. So as you can see, the majority of people are treated with metformin and then uh, a mix of other single drugs. Very easy to predict, people are following the guideline and if you have low renal function, you end up with something other than metformin. We did this with, uh, for hypertension, uh, diabetes, and uh, depression. This is the uh, diabetes data. So now within Stanford, we start looking at what happens after treatment. So if you're in that inner circle, and you've gotten one of the single drugs, what is the rate at which your glycosylated hemoglobin actually drops? Okay, so if the single drug works for you, life is good. Uh, th this plot is just showing metformin versus glipizide. The study was done with 250 million patients worth of data in a federated setting, of course. So then, okay, I know that if the first line drug works, that's great, but how many people in whom 
We give the first line drug, and then their A1C is still not under control. So at Stanford, we've built a search engine where you can define your question, in this case, diabetics, which I'm going to define as having a particular ICD-9 code and a metformin prescription within a week to one month. And then after that, having a high A1C one to two months after treatment. So I can actually type this out as three lines of code and in a, a couple of milliseconds get the people who are not yet uh, having their A1C under control. I was going to do a live query, but figured out that it would be kind of awkward to do here, so all I have is screenshots. This does work. I actually showed it to Steve uh, uh, b before the panel. OK, so now I know what happens in the innermost circle. Let's say the, the, these 553 people, for them, I have to choose where do you go from uh, metformin to uh, glipizide, pioglitazone, or cetagliptin. That's where we don't have evidence. OK, so I asked the question. How many of these people who had high A1C one to two months after treatment were prescribed glipizide? Turns out about 161. And I can do the same query for pyoglitazone and cetagliptin. And once I'm done with that, I can start asking the question that metformin and then glipizide versus pyoglitazone or cetagliptin versus glipizide and cetagliptin versus pyoglitazone, which pathway is better? And what I'm showing you is the hazards of getting your A1C drop by 10% or more if you started out at 6.5, no, no difference. OK, what happens if you have 7 as your starting point? 7.5 and 8. This is matched on uh, you know, propensities of getting the treatment, age, gender, ethnicity, all of the different comorbidities, and so on. So it looks like, again, observational, that in our data set, we see that people with high A1C to start with, if you move them to cetagliptin, it may be better for them. Again, this is observational, so take it with a grain of salt. I actually did this in, in, a, in a couple of hours uh, just before uh, this uh, meeting. OK, second question. For a 55 to 60-year-old white male patient with newly diagnosed plasma cell leukemia, what's the difference in overall survival in patients treated with intensive versus less intensive chemotherapy? This is a real question coming in from an oncology fellow. So here we have another problem now of patient similarity. And to give you an intuition, think of these two axes. The vertical axis is the similarity in terms of the propensity to get the treatment, and you want people with the same propensity to get treatment as the person in front of you. So let's say we have a bunch of patients, and the red dots are the ones that have the same propensity to get treated as your patient. But then you have this second dimension, which is the horizontal axis, as to they you need them to be similar to your patient. So you're putting in another filter, you end up with very few people. So this is just an intuition. In practice, that's what it looks like. 55-year-old a uh, 55 to 60-year-old white male with plasma cell leukemia, and we match on everything else, you get five people. OK, not enough to do any statistics. Red is the, those who got intensive chemo. Blue is those who got the less intensive chemo. But now I can, because I can run this as a query, I can drop or change the age constraint. OK, now I have 17 people. I can drop age entirely. I can drop the ethnicity can drop the gender. So based on 69 people, it appears that intensive chemo is associated with a survival advantage. I can also change the disease and zoom out a bit and say, instead of plasma cell leukemia, let's look at all patients with multiple myelomas. The same trend holds. So that's the idea of an informatics consult. Just like radiology, just like pathology, refer me a case. And we would want to provide you with a descriptive summary of what happened after treatment, what treatment choices are typically made given the prior medical history, what are the typical outcomes, or if possible, get to this last bullet point of what is the effect of treatment choice X on outcome Y. That's a hard problem. And I'll show you one uh, uh, vignette about uh, uh, what we're doing about that. So this is based on simulated data. So I know all the variables. I know all the treatment effects and everything. What we're looking at on the x-axis is patient index going from 0 to 1,000. So we're looking at data from 1,000 people. On the y-axis, what we have is the error in the estimate that I obtain for the particular treatment effect of a given intervention. 
if I estimate it to be exactly what I know is the truth, you're at zero. And the, the dark band in the middle is about 10% uh, error from, uh, from, the, uh, from having no error, okay? The orange line going through is the estimate you get if you apply classical methods from epidemiology. You get a population average, which will be centered on zero, so the orange line passes through the zero, and for some patients, you underestimate the effect, for some, you overestimate the effect. We kind of know that. This is how population estimates work. The blue lines are slightly fancier ways of running a regression, a penalized regression, and it improves a little bit, but not too much. The green dots are a new algorithm that we're working on with uh, Trevor Hasty, uh, uh, Rob Tipsharani, and his student, graduate student, Scott Powers, to see that can we estimate a personalized treatment effect? And the take home here is that 63% of the green dots are in that band as opposed to 13 or 15% of the other ones. So it looks like it may be possible to do if you have good data. So again, without good data, nothing happens. So this is how we envision the whole thing would work. Uh, you have a clinical situation. If you have a guideline available, by all means, go use it. Otherwise, press this green button. We envision an actual button in Epic, but we haven't figured that one out yet. And that's the informatics consult idea. Send me a case, and within 24 hours, we would send you a one-page report back to the best of our ability, or say, cannot tell you anything given the data we have. And if we have enough uh, similar patients, I give you something I call practice-based evidence. Otherwise, we keep doing what we're doing, but as a byproduct, we will collect information about what are the situations for which there's genuine clinical ambiguity, which we can then queue up for point-of-care randomization or further study some later day. So that's the idea, and I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>